we're back and now we're talking a little bit more about diffusion and we looked at uh, calculating the size of a giant component in a random graph as, as one heuristic approximation to uh, the extent of a diffusion and the probability. And now what we're going to look at is another model which is known as the SIS model and it's a simple model of diffusion. It's highly stylized, it's um, not directly applicable to a lot of things, but it's a useful model because it gives us some basic intuitions of how things work. We can bring in degree distributions, we can vary them, we can get comparative statics out. So a lot of the insights that will come out of this model will be quite useful, even if the model is, is a, a little bit too simple and stark to actually match a lot of things. So um, what's the, the structure of this model? So the, this model comes out of a, a, a model that's been used and, and studied a lot in epidemiology. Um, there were a set of models by Bailey in the 1970s that uh, you know, sort of defined a lot of these things. Um, the, there's, so what does S stand for? Susceptible. Um, so basically we've got uh, susceptible And then I infected, and then susceptible again. So the idea here is you can recover. So you, you can catch something, uh, you become infected, so you're susceptible, you can catch it, you get it, um, then you recover. And this is something which you can catch over time. So it might be something like I uh, erase a, a virus from my computer, um, I'm susceptible again, now I can catch them. Uh, a new one comes, I catch it again, I erase it, um, and so forth. So I go back and forth from this process of you know, uh, realizing that I have a virus, getting rid of it, um, and then catching it again later in time. Um, okay, so the, the, the key thing is, is uh, nodes are going to move back and forth over time. And, uh, you know, you can think of this as, as uh, I might be changing my mind over time uh, and, and various things, but, um, but we'll look at the basics of it. <clears throat> so nodes are in these two states, infected or susceptible. The probability that you get infected in the simplest version of this model is just proportional to the number of infected neighbors with some rate, um, uh, let's say V greater than zero, um, and uh, we'll add in a spontaneous epsilon so that you can catch uh, things as in the BAS model, and then you get well in any period um, with at some rate delta. So this is like the BAS model, except here you can actually reverse yourself and get well, and that's going to happen with a, a rate delta greater than zero. And let's let rho be the percent of the population that's infected at any point in time. So what we're going to want to do is make predictions about rho as a function of the network and, and these other parameters of the model. So what we're going to do is start with a simple version where all the in individuals, players, agents in the society, the nodes are going to mix with even probabilities. So you random meet one person per unit of time, and uh, that's just going to give us a large Markov chain, and we can do calculations on that. And the steady state distribution is just going to be one in which um, the, the change of this infection parameter rho um, with respect to time is zero. So the simplest version of this model is one where there's not actually an explicit network structure. It's just a completely random process. And this looks a lot like the BAS model in its basic form. And then we'll bring in network structure on top of this in just a few minutes. So let's start with the simplest version. Um, so what's the change in the infected population over time? Well, you can only become infected if you're not infected yet. So you're susceptible. So this is the... Um, susceptible size of the population, then you catch it from a given individual with uh, um, V times rho, and epsilon is the spontaneous rate. So this looks a lot like the BAS model did, basically the same functional form as the BAS model. But what we're also going to do is we're going to have people rec uh, recovering over time, and so we'll look for a steady state. So um, out of those who are infected, they recover at some rate delta. And so all put together, you're gaining new infection at this rate and losing infection at this rate. And in order for this to be in steady state, these two things are going to have to balance. The new infection rate is going to have to um, uh, balance against the, the number of people who are recovering for a period of time. And so if you solve this, 
um, uh, equation, then uh, you get an expression for what rho looks like as a function of the rest of the parameters um, in, in this setting. Okay? So there we've got a, a simple equation and a simple um, solution, and now we're looking for a steady state, and what we've done is we've enriched this BAS model, essentially, to have um, a recovery part, which then allows for uh, a steady state distribution, which is going to be different from everybody becoming affected. So if we, uh, if we let epsilon go to zero, and then we solve this, um, basically we end up with two solutions. One is that nobody's infected, nobody gets infected, and then the other one, the more interesting one, um, is that uh, rho is equal to 1 minus delta over V. Um, so if this turns out to be greater than 0. So if, if uh, um, delta is, is bigger than V, basically what does that mean? That means that people recover so fast that this thing will never really take root. But if delta is smaller than V, so you can catch things faster than you can recover from them, then rho can be positive. And basically, the smaller delta is and the larger V is, the larger rho is going to be. So rho is increasing in uh, V and decreasing in delta. Um, and it only has this positive uh, solution as long as um, delta is less than V. Right? So, so we have a simple solution and uh, you know, very, very simple steady state here. So this now hasn't brought in the network structure at all, so this is like the BAS model, but now with a recovery rate, and we end up with a solution here, um, which makes sense as, as, as long as uh, delta is less than V. Okay. So uh, we've, we've got um, a, an infection, in, at least when uh, delta is less than V, where it's going to stay at some level. For low recovery rates, this can lead to large infections. Um, and uh, what we haven't brought in yet is where's the network, right? So this is uniformly at random interaction. We're missing the heterogeneity and degree. We're missing local patterns. And what we're going to do is, is we're going to start by just bringing this in. And um, bringing in local patterns and explicit network structure is going to be a, little, a lot more difficult without doing simulation. And so what we'll start with is, is just taking a look at how we might bring in the fact that some people are going to have more interactions per unit time than other individuals. Okay. And so exploring the, the dependence of this on the degree distribution is what we're going to do is start by having a random matching process where each different individual might have a different degree and their degree is just going to tell you how many matches per unit of time they're going to have. Okay. And um, what we're going to keep track of now is the fraction of nodes, not just overall, which are infected, but also as a function of the degree. So it might be the people that have three interactions per unit of time have a higher infection rate than people who have two interactions per unit of time, and so forth. Okay. And another thing we're going to keep track of is um, if I'm meeting a random person in the population, so I, each period I'm meeting some number of people, my DI, so say this is four, I'm going to meet four people per unit of time, um, what's the chance that any one of those four people is infected? And theta is going to be that fraction. Okay? Now, what's going to be important is the fraction of people overall that might have something in the population is not going to be the same as the fraction of people I meet because I'm more likely to meet people who are meeting lots of people. So some people have lots of interactions. Those are the people I'm more likely to meet. Those are also the people who are going to be more likely to be infected. Okay, so, so that's the, the process that's going on. Okay, so how are we going to deal with this? Um, let's deal with, again, this is this random matching process. So let's let P of D be our degree distribution. So this is the fraction of nodes that have degree D. And uh, when I think about what's the probability that I'm going to meet somebody in terms of this random process where we're all randomly matched, I'm much more likely to meet somebody with high degree and in particular, um, given that the high degree people, if somebody has 10 meetings per unit of time, they're going to have to meet 10 people. Somebody that has five meetings per unit of time is only going to meet five people. The person with 10 is going to be twice as likely to be met by somebody as the person with five meetings. So the people with more meetings are going to be easier to find, and the likelihood of meeting a node of degree D is going to be directly proportional to their degree compared to the average degree. 
So we look at the fraction of those people in the population, but we have to reweight that by what's their relative degree compared to the average degree in the population, because that's going to determine how many meanings they have and how easy it is to find them when you're bumping into people in the population. Okay? So that's an important thing, and that's a critical thing for understanding contagion processes more generally. We've already seen it once earlier in the course, um, and uh, you know, this is important in, in trying to understand the fact of, uh, or the, the operation of this SIS model. Okay, so if we want to calculate the um, fraction of infected people I'm likely to meet, well, this is the likelihood that I'm going to meet somebody of degree D. This is how likely they are to be infected. And then we're just going to sum across Ds, and that gives us a theta. Okay, so we have an expression now for theta, and we're going to have to just solve this expression and um, see what, what it gives us. So this is the fraction of infected neighbors, random part uh, partners. If we look at steady states, steady states are going to tell us for each different degree, we have to have um, the change over time of the infection rate of different degrees all going uh, not, uh, being zero. So what we end up with is the, uh, th this infection rate for each different um, type being zero. and uh, well, we know what the, those infection rates look like for different types, and so we can then set that equal to zero. What does that infection rate look like for different types? Well, um, so the, the fraction of people of type D that are currently susceptible is 1 minus rho of D. The chance that they meet Infected individuals, number of infected individuals per unit of time they're likely to meet is theta times D. And the chance they get infected by one of them is, is V. So this is the, the rate at which they're going to gain infections. And then they get better at a rate delta. So they, they recover, they get rid of their computer virus. Um, they recover from whatever cold or, or they had. Um, so, so here we've got a situation where we've got uh, an expression now that involves um, our theta, and we can solve this um, for each row of D. This has to be equal to zero. So steady state sets this equal uh, to zero, and basically that tells us that the row of D for any given D is going to be proportional to um, this expression over here, lambda theta D over lambda theta D plus one, where lambda is um, V over delta. So what's the relative rate at which you get infected compared to the rate at which you get better? Um, so generally for this infection to take hold, um, this expression is going to be something which is bigger than one. And uh, so here we've got um, something which sort of uh, captures the, uh, well, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be bigger than one in, in settings where we have different degree distributions. Um, but uh, so this, this is going to be a very useful parameter. And this happens because when we solve through, it's only the relative rates of V and D that matter and not the absolute rate. So if we doubled both of these and the expression was already uh, solved, we'd get the same solution. So um, these are scaling together. And it's, it's relative rates at which you get infected and recover that matter, not the absolute rates. OK. So solving this equation, um, we've got this uh, expression now for rho of d. We can plug that back into our expression for theta, and then we end up with theta equals um, a function of theta, which now depends only on the primitives of what's the degree distribution, uh, what's the infection, relative infection compared to a recovery rate in this. Um, and those are the only expressions that enter in. So we've got expected degrees and so forth. And now we've got to solve this for theta. Okay. So we've got theta as a function of h of theta, which is where h of theta is this big expression over here. Um, so we've got some function of theta. Um, and basically, we're, we're going to look for a fixed point of this expression. Okay. So now we've boiled everything down, this model to a simple equation that one can solve. Okay. Um, so solving this equation, uh, we, we know that theta has, is, is some expression which is a function of the p's and so forth. 
Um, generally, this isn't going to be uh, easy to solve. We can solve it by simulation. It's a nonlinear equation. It depends on the expected degrees and the full degree distribution and the lambdas. Um, but what we can do is, is do some fairly easy comparative statics and say, let's suppose that we increase the probability of higher degree nodes. What's that going to do to theta? Um, what happens as we change the expected degree? Does, uh, what happens as we change lambda? So we can do different comparative statics and begin to understand how these things work. Um, okay, so in particular we want to uh, ask what h of theta looks like and how it depends on these different parameters, um, the degree distribution, the expected degree, and so forth. So solving this will depend on, on uh, making sense out of these. So let me just go through how this looks in terms of uh, the solutions. So um, basically, when we go back um, to this, we're trying to, to look for thetas which solve this equation. We want theta equal to h of theta. Um, h of theta is going to be an increasing and concave function, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. So h of theta is, is increasing in theta and it's uh, a, a concave function. And in particular, when we look at um, looking for thetas and h of thetas that uh, intersect, one possibility is, is theta zero. So if nobody's infected, then nobody gets infected in this model. And so one steady state is no infection. Um, and once you eradicate something, it just doesn't come back. Another possible steady state is a positive one. But it's going to depend on what this h function looks like. So it could be that this h function is so shallow that there's no positive solution. It could be that it's a steeper function and uh, the concavity will give us a positive solution to it. So understanding whether this works uh, in terms of having a, a non-zero steady state in this is going to depend on the properties of this h function, which depend on the dis degree distribution, uh, the uh, relative infection rate, and so forth. So even though there's a little bit of technicality here, the intuitions are fairly simple. Um, basically, more degree, uh, higher degree nodes, more interactions, higher um, uh, ex uh, infection rates in terms of the V compared to delta are going to lead to higher Hs, which are going to lead to um, higher steady states and more infection in a population. Okay? So we're going to take a look at that in some detail next. Um, that'll be our next uh, look in, in, in more detail at the diffusion process. So we'll solve out the SIS model for, for um, uh, explicit expressions in different settings and then look at uh, what we can say about comparative statics.